recording this today. So that is now set up so that um, everybody, you don't have to take notes. You can revisit later because we will in fact send this recording to you. Um, as mm -hmm. always, I wanna thank Tamron big time for being here, for putting this presentation together. If you haven't met Jillian before, I mean, hopefully most of you have probably met Ben before, either in the store or on this screen. <laughs> Um, Jillian is a phenomenal instructor. Ben is our wonderful rep who always helps us make things happen like this. So tonight we're going to be asking that folks keep um, your video and your um, audio muted. If you could please turn those off. We do love seeing you and we love hearing from you, but we want to make sure Jillian can make it through the presentation easily. Um, and that we don't end up with any bandwidth issues. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, if you have questions about Looking Glass, I am here for you. I will be in the chat. I will be monitoring to make sure that uh, we're letting in participants as they might be coming in late. And uh, Looking Glass, we're always here to help. So let me know what we can do for you. Time frame for the meeting runtime is about 45 minutes. And then I, I definitely leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A to customize this conversation to whatever you guys want to learn about. Great question. Yeah, and let's, uh, any questions that you, you guys have, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, uh, Jen and I will be in the chat room watching for questions. We'll uh, answer any that are about you know, looking glass or if it's a Tamron question I can answer. Um, we can do that. Otherwise, we'll save any questions for Jillian for that Q&A section at the end. Um, and then I just want to say thank you to Jen and Looking Glass for partnering with us to do these kinds of uh, classes and uh, bring you this kind of content because, uh, you know, while we're, you're slowly seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, this is still the, the best and safest way, uh, I think, to bring this kind of content uh, to everybody. So. Um, uh, definitely uh, check out Looking Glass. I mean, it looks like so many of you are actually uh, Californians. So that uh, should put Looking Glass right at the top of your list uh, for your photographic needs. Um, but uh, a quick word, since it's sort of my job to uh, to do that, um, uh, a quick word on uh, Tamron rebates that we have uh, going on right now that you can get at Looking Glass Camera. Um, up to $200 in savings. You can see uh, there in the graphic um, a little bit of uh, something for everybody. Long lenses, the, the 150 to 600, which is of course one of uh, Tamron's most popular, uh, most sought after um, you know, lenses out there. The 18 to 400, which is one of the most popular. Uh, and then a few of our lenses for the, uh, the Sony mirrorless system, which uh, is very popular right now. It seems like so many people uh, are, are you know, transferring over to that. So, um, and then a quick note on uh, lenses that we have announced that are coming up, which we're really excited about. Looking Glass is really excited about, and we think you guys are really excited about too. Uh, and that is uh, starting with, I think, the 11 to 20. Is that what we have uh, first here, Jillian? Mm -hmm. It sure is. So the 11 to 20 is a uh, wide angle uh, zoom lens for crop sensor Sony cameras. So if you are shooting on a Sony A6000 uh, or anything within that system, um, you're going to want to check this out. It's F28 all the way through, like you see there. And then, of course, the other one, uh, you had mentioned before, our 150 to 600 being um, one of our most popular, one of the, the best, uh, you know, best known lenses, long lenses in its class in the market. Um, now we are introducing essentially that lens, the 150 to 500 for the Sony mirrorless uh, full frame uh, as well. So this is going to be a rock star if you guys are into bird photography um if you're uh, uh you know uh, like chris in uganda who's photographing uh, on safaris and wildlife and need long lenses uh chris i don't know if you've uh, switched over to sony yet but if you are shooting anything sony you're going to want to get your hands on this um this guy's going to be huge epic. um but enough on that taking up enough time as that is. Uh, today our subject is going into darkness uh, and we are lucky enough to have uh, Jillian here to give us the, uh, you know, everything um, uh, on photographing in low light or uh, after dark situations. Um, I believe I've seen, uh, I don't know this presentation or this class, but I've seen Jillian speak on this topic before. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and she, you guys are going to get a very thorough 
presentation here. So <laughs> make sure you're ready to take notes. Uh, do your screen captures like we talked about. Um, put your questions in the chat room and uh, we will see you guys at the end. Take it away, Jillian, inspire us. Thank you, Ben. Yes, my name is Jillian Bell. I go by Bell Tamron USA on social media. It's just a little bit easier to spell on Instagram and Facebook mostly. Um, like Ben is a regional sales representative, making sure our camera stores like Looking Glass are well trained and well taken care of. I come in on the education side as a photographer, as an educator, and as an artist to lead photo workshops. And he is not kidding. This is a very, very thorough look at night photography. I'm definitely a creative when I when I describe my work, when I describe my photography style, and. There's, there's three sort of main topics we're going to talk about tonight, the illuminating topics, as I say. First, we'll cover night photography, the moon, the stars, thinking about star trails. And I bring this forward in, in, the, um, in the voice of I am not a landscape photographer, huge disclaimer. Uh, my, my specialties are in, in um, creative storytelling, architecture, macro, still lives and products. So I really enjoyed putting this first section together as far as someone who gets a little apprehensive when going out into darkness trying to photograph the night skies and the, and the full moon and things like that so i'm going to lay out some really easy how-to techniques on this first section so if you were also like me and at first a little hesitant to go out at night and photograph the stars because you have no idea where to start uh, this will give you a really good foundation to go out on Second and third, we're going to get into more of my wheelhouse, uh, painting with light, how to bring light into these scenes in more of a creative aspect. First, looking at landscapes, then making shapes, and then lastly, low light, still life painting. Lastly, I'm just going to touch on low key photography. What is it? How do we layer these tones and these textures together when we're really trying to highlight those shadows in any photograph you're trying to take? Like Ben said, I do have the chat open here. If there, is a, if there is a question that comes up that is right in line with what I'm talking about, I'll definitely address it. But um, again, I like to leave that time at the end so we can really customize this conversation to your needs because that's why you're here. Lots of quick tips. Again, this is one of those wordy slides I was warning you about. But we think about night photography as a whole. We think about certain things. It's definitely about being prepared doing your due diligence, doing your research, going out with a purpose, with a plan, and hopefully with a friend. We wanna bring flashlights for light painting and headlamps for moving around. We use headlamps so that we can be hands-free. We can really work with our equipment and headlamps will also often have a red filter on them. Red filters are great for our eyes. Once we adjust for these low light situations, we do not want to turn lights on. Because once we turn lights on, our eyes have to readjust. And in this process, you're not going to see as many stars as you think there are. You're not going to be able to walk around as freely, and you might run into some things. So we let our eyes adjust. We give ourselves at least 10 to 15 minutes just to take in the scene and get comfortable with these dark areas we're in. Bring your patience and your flexibility. Uh, I say the weather may affect your plans, but it almost most certainly will. So again, go out with a plan but make sure to, to make adjustments where needed. Lastly, expect these long shutter speeds and manual exposure modes. We're not gonna trust our meter most of the time because uh, the meter's not gonna necessarily be able to read, again, this darkness. So I'm gonna, again, give you some foundations, some exposures to start with and give you the confidence, hopefully, to make these adjustments and um, just kind of play around with it while you're out there. When we're talking about equipment, efficiency, a comfortable, compact camera bag, these are all things that I like to keep in mind. Traditionally, out in the wilderness, we're going to try to get as far away from civilization as possible. We want it to be dark. So you're going to want to have a camera bag that is light, that is comfortable. If you're, if you're one of those people who like to hike for miles and miles, make sure you have a gear bag that you can keep with you while you hike out into the wilderness. I'm going to talk about what camera and lens to bring um, in each of these specific sections because it does vary a little bit depending on what your purpose is. Lots of accessories, 
plenty of media, extra batteries, extra memory cards, filters, so like a neutral density filter sometimes comes into play here, flashlights of course, nice sturdy tripod that won't cause vibrations if a car drives by or if the wind picks up. Cable releases, um, this is something where if you can get a corded cable release, it's going to be to your advantage. I remember one one night in December here in northern Minnesota, there was a moon dog, which is basically this gorgeous ring of light around the full moon coming up over the horizon. It was 35 below Fahrenheit here at home. I didn't want to stand out in that temperature to take these photos. So I had a really nice long cable release. So I could sit in my car with the heat running and I could still take photos of my camera that was sitting right outside. If you need a timer, like a, a two second or a 10 second timer, and you're with a group of people, do your group mates a favor and just shut that beep off so that we don't hear the countdown, as they say. Lastly, if you're fortunate enough to play with a sky scanner or a tracker, this is something that locks onto a certain element, like the moon. And for long exposures with the moon, it'll actually uh, move your camera. It's a type of tripod head. It'll move your camera with the moon during these long exposures so that you won't see the, the ghosting or the trailing of the light in your scene. They're pretty cool. Last little tip before we get into the specific shooting situations. This has to do with research. So when, we, when, when I poll other night photographers, you know, in the apps that they gravitate towards, these are going to be the four most popular ones. Sky Guide, Photo Pills, there's an Aurora app for, for um, Night skies, um, what am I thinking of? <laughs> the Northern Lights, that's what I'm thinking of. The Aurora Borealis. And then lastly, having a really good weather app. All of these things are really going to help make your planning much easier. And then, you know, the research comes into play depending on what you want to photograph. You know, when, when I go out, it's all about timing. It's all about angle of which I'm going to put my camera. So I want to know things like where's the city light coming from? Where's that urban glow that I potentially do not want in my frame? What time does the moon rise? What time does it set? Because this will affect my exposure. This will affect my photographs. What time does the sun come up? What time does it set? Dates of meteor showers, dates of eclipses, any other significant astrological event. These are good things to know. It gives you a purpose to go out and photograph. And then lastly, um, this angle of the galactic core, that has to do with the Milky Way. So what angle is your Milky Way in your sky? It will change depending on the seasons. It changes the photo. But let's start, let's start easy. Let's, let's really just kind of dip our feet into this idea. Let's start with photographing the moon. So when we photograph the moon, it's important to remember that a full moon light it's just reflected sunlight. So if we think about photographing on a nice, bright, sunny day, if you've ever heard of the sunny 16 rule, this is, this is kind of this idea of dipping into, again, that, that manual exposure mode if you're not familiar or confident with shooting in manual exposure. If it's a bright, sunny day, nice, hard shadows on the ground, the sunny 16 rule is basically this. You set your aperture, again, in manual mode to f16, and a proper exposure will equal your shutter speed 1 over your ISO. So F16, 1 400th of a second at 400 ISO. Now with the moon, because it's reflected light, it's not quite as bright. So we're going to open up that aperture a little bit. And there is a, uh, the rule is called the Looney 11 rule. That's what they call it. Easier to remember. Same idea. F11. Your shutter speed is equal to 1 over your ISO. The, uh, this is the simplest way to get into night photography. Handheld, perfectly fine. Turn your stabilization on. Get that 150 to 600 out. 70 to 300, 100 to 400. We definitely want a telephoto lens so we can fill that frame with the moon and not worry about any of those other foreground elements. To go one step easier, this I took in program mode, so automatic mode in my camera. Uh, I was out on my morning walk with my 100 to 400 millimeter lens. And you might think, why is she out with an ultra telephoto out at 8 o'clock in the morning? It's primarily because I'm an active birder. I love the morning birds 
all the chirping, all the noises, all the singing. Um, here we've got a really good migration of the ducks, of, of goldfinches and orioles, cardinals, all those beautiful songbirds. And when I don't bring my camera with, they all come out to say hi. <laughs> so I always bring it just in case. This specific morning, I didn't realize the moon was still out. It hadn't set yet. And so this is a beautiful photograph of the moon, just in program or automatic mode, using a branch or some trees to fill in my foreground, give me a little bit better texture. And I'm able to get definition with the sky and with the moon because they're very similar in brightness. We traditionally have a dilemma when we talk about full moon photography. And the dilemma is this, the distance and the dynamic range is too far apart for us to get a good photograph of both a foreground element and the subject, which is the moon. So in this case, I like to put, I like to put branches and trees in my foreground to give me a little bit of texture, just to kind of fill in that frame a little bit. But what happens is the moon is so bright in comparison to the night sky, it is, it is almost impossible to get stars and the moon in the same frame or your foreground element and the moon to be both in focus and properly exposed in the same frame. So my solution in this situation is just to do a simple two image stack. Bring these two images into photo Photoshop, use a quick mask mode to separate my different elements so that I could tuck my moon into those trees the way that I want it. Again, taking the first photo to expose and to focus on the foreground element and the sky, taking the second photo to focus specifically on the moon and get that good detail there. Now there's a really cool advantage to this technique. You can make this moon as big as you want. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where if you want it to be actual size or if you want it to be exaggerated, by all means, do what you need. Also thinking about white balance a little bit in this scene specifically, the cameras are going to want to make a lit moon. They want to make it gray. They want to, they want to balance out that light. So for this photo specifically, I set my white balance to a um, uh, cloudy or a shady white balance temperature because the, the bright orange harvest moon was, was just really washed out in an auto white balance situation. So by turning it to shady or cloudy, I could bring those warm tones back in and, and more accurately depict what the moon looked like. All right, so now that we have confidence in photographing the full moon, let's move on to photographing the stars. And now when I talk about photographing the stars in this first scenario, we're generally talking about the Milky Way. We want those pinpoint stars. Quick tips, know what you want to shoot before you shoot. This is um, kind of a, um, an overarching theme in this presentation. Know what you want to go photograph. Know what you want the photo to look like before you go out there. Have everything you need in a handy pocket. When we want to photograph the stars, we do not want the moon in the scene. We want a new moon or a, or a no, the moon has set, it's not in the sky at all sort of situation. So it's going to be very, very dark. And you want to be able to find your lenses. You want to be able to find your snacks, your water, whatever you need without looking at it. Like you really want to be able to know your bag because it's going to be dark. Have a good tripod, use that cable release again. Um, I'm going to set my lens to manual focus at infinity. And then I'm going to use gaff tape to tape it down. Uh, gaff tape in the photo world is like duct tape to the handyman. Um, it's, it's like duct tape or like a really nice adhesive thick piece of tape, but it doesn't leave the residue on your electronics and it comes in black. So um, I take about a three foot strip of it and wrap it around my tripod. So I always have some when I need it. In this specific situation, because we're on a tripod, turn that stabilization off. In Tamron land, it's VC, vibration compensation, but other lenses, it's known as VR, IS, OS, whatever it might be. Even if it's in body stabilization, you want to shut all of that off. If you're one of those people that um, really needs to have an accurate sky color depiction, I'm not. I, I kind of change it depending on what I think the photo wants to look like. But you can set a custom white balance or a Kelvin temperature white balance. If it's the Milky Way, it's going to be 3900 Kelvin approximately. Moonlight is going to be 3000 Kelvin approximately. And then if you've got a dark sky, uh, tungsten light is generally pretty, pretty proper, which is uh, 3200 Kelvin. 
lots of inference. Specifically when we're photographing the Milky Way here, mid or wide angle lenses work best. So in the, in the Tamra land, we're looking at the 11 to 20. I'm the new lens, I'm looking forward to taking that out and taking some night skies to your photos. 10 to 24, the 15 to 30, even a 24 to 70 will do, will do okay. You know, you want something definitely wider than 50 millimeters. And then for our exposure, we technically look at the 500 rule. There's another rule you can write down and look up later. It's basically 500 is divided by your focal length. This is going to give you the longest still star exposure. Any longer time than this recommended time, you're going to see the little tails. You're going to see those little streaks in the stars. And for this specific purpose, we don't want that. We want nice pinpoint stars. Generally, you ask any photographer out there, we're going to start with f2.8, 3200 ISO at 30 seconds, and then adjust accordingly. Because of that 500 rule, I wanted to just put up a couple of other exposures or some other focal lengths so you can see the difference. At 45 millimeters, we're actually looking at 10 seconds time, much shorter than 30 seconds. 35 millimeter, 14 seconds. 17 millimeters, 30 seconds. So again, be flexible. You start seeing those little, those little tails when you're zooming in on your photographs. Just quicken up the time a little bit and that'll take care of it. Thinking about, again, that galactic core, what angle is the Milky Way going to be when you're out photographing? Now, the PhotoPills app is a great application for this. I'm not sponsored by them specifically, but I like their planning feature. So you can go to a specific area virtually through the app, and it'll tell you the specifics as far as, you know, what's the moon doing? What's the sun doing? What is the angle of the Milky Way? Can we plan this out before we get out there? This is early summer, so you can see it's kind of off at a nice angle. We're creating some beautiful converging lines here with the horizon. In the late summer, it goes almost vertical. So now this frame works better in a vertical orientation using this fen post as a good anchor for that Milky Way. Glad to see not a ton of questions. That means you guys are all confident with this, hopefully. If we're going to progress this idea just a little bit further, thinking about star trails, again, those wide to mid angle lenses are gonna work best. So anything wider than, than 24, 15, 17, 10, you know, anything nice and wide is gonna work really well here because we want to fill the frame with stars. Maybe think about having a, a fun silhouetted thing in, in your foreground to just kind of add a little bit of a foundation, a little bit of another visual element. Again, big thing here, be prepared. Plan out your photos, um, bring snacks, bring light layers, bring something to do. I've definitely photographed uh, a night sky for like two hours while I'm waiting it for uh, the photo to process, the photo to take. And uh, you can play solitaire pretty well with a red headlamp. The, the hearts and the diamonds are a little bit harder to see, but I've definitely done it before. With star trails, I like to show, showcase two different techniques. Because again, for me, this was a little bit of a, of a, I don't know if I know how to do this, but I'm gonna go out and try kind of scenario. And using the first technique, if we use an intervalometer, it actually simplifies this whole idea to be very achievable to, for any level of photographer. This is the easiest and most foolproof way to photograph star trails. So using an intervalometer, this basically stacks time-lapse photos into one picture. They're much easier to adjust. You have a much, much higher success right here. You know, if you take 100 photos and you, you, mess, you accidentally bump the tripod or you mess up 10 out of the 100, you know, it's still going to be okay. It's still going to look like a good photograph. We want to use JPEG photos. And if at all possible, you want to use an in-camera stack in your menu system. There are some newer cameras that offer this as a feature, and it is foolproof. It is so easy, as long as you have time. In this scenario, um, basically, you, you hit go. You say how much time you want. So I want one photo every minute for an hour. So you got 60 photos. Or maybe I want one photo every three minutes for six hours. 
whatever it might be, you can set that up in your menu and then it will process the time. It takes a long time for, for it to compile all these photos together, but you're left with all of the individual ones and then the final compiled image right in camera while you're sleeping overnight. Great question, Luke. Why JPEG? Uh, JPEG specifically because of size. You know, so for these photographs, we know what the exposure is going to be. We figure that out ahead of time using that Milky Way equation, F2.8, 3200 ISO at 20 to 30 seconds. So you figure that out first. We know what the we know what the white balance is going to be. We kind of set everything up so we know our exposure is going to be good. And if we used a raw file format in this specific scenario, think about how large that final image would be. You know, if we're stacking 100 photographs and each photograph is even 10 megs, that is, that is a huge file. My camera might not be able to process something that large. My computer might not be able to process something that large. So in this case, because we've got our exposure and everything sort of dialed in ahead of time, uh, JPEG is just a much faster and much smaller file for your electronics to deal with. AC power, if available, batteries, I cannot stress this enough, must be full. I say this because um, I'm thinking, thinking again about the fact that your, photo, your camera is going to be running and working and processing for at least an hour, if not two. Uh, when we deal with really, really long exposures, um, I'm also going to take an extra step and shut off my auto noise reduction filters. I'm going to shut off any sort of processing above the writing aspect that my camera is going to do because it's not uncommon for your camera to take just as long to process the image to your card as it is to physically expose that image. So in this case, this photo is 10 minutes and 30 seconds. It's going to take about 10 minutes for that camera to process and be ready to take the next photograph. Taking this idea one step further, if my exposure is an hour, using neutral density filters here to really stretch out that time and use a, a full hour to take one photo. It's going to take an hour to write that photo onto your card. And the last thing you want, this has actually happened to me, is a half an hour into that write process, my battery dies and I lose the whole picture. I've got to start over. So make sure your batteries are full. Plug them in if at all possible. It'll, again, save your sanity later on. The second technique for, for star trails is just having really, really long exposures. Again, um, camera is open for up to an hour. Again, you might need these neutral density filters to really slow down your time. The exposure is a little different here. Again, we're going to really open up our lenses, f2.8, f4. Aperture is going to be very common. But my ISO in these cases are going to be very low. Milky Way photos, 3200 ISO is common. Star trail photographs, really long exposures, we want ISO of 100 or 200 because we do not want noise. The sensor is going to create a little bit of noise because, again, it's, it's taking that exposure for so long, but um, using a lower ISO is just going to help diminish any noise that, that might be in these pictures. In these specific situations, uh, we bring as many cameras as, as we have available. Doesn't matter what brand it is, doesn't matter what lens you put on it, as long as it's a wide angle, preferably a Tamron. But when we bring multiple cameras, again, these exposures are going to be very, very long. So I can set up a couple of different angles, a couple of different focal lengths, a couple of different options, just in case one of them fails. Taking this idea again one step further, now we're going to add some light creatively into these scenes. This uh, is called light painting. So in these scenarios, we've got a flashlight. I like a white LED flashlight. They're nice and bright and um, they're, they're great for finding what that white balance is supposed to be and just making the colors correct. You can put gels on your flashlights. You can add colors if you want. Again, it's your photo to create. But traditionally, I bring a white LED flashlight and then um, lots of batteries and possibly some colors that I can put over that initial white light. Big difference for white paint for light painting is really just to fill in your foreground. So this photo, we already know what the exposure is supposed to be. F2.8, 3200 ISO. This one ends up being 20 seconds. Milky Way photo is the main goal for this shot. 
And then during those 20 seconds when that photo was being exposed, I grabbed my flashlight and just painted that light. I'm going to keep that light moving and just shining my foreground. Turn silhouettes into physical foreground elements. Just another, another layer of interest. <laughs> Jeff, I do not know why they put solar panels on the windmill. Maybe that's to help keep it running. But it's also, yeah, I don't know, did not ask. In this situation, this is a new moon, so we didn't have a lot of shadows, nice, soft light. So not a lot of urban, um, not a lot of urban pollution, not a lot of light pollution from the moon. Again, Milky Way exposure, we already know what that's supposed to be. The flashlight here was just used to fill in the building. And it's important when you go out to wear black, to wear dark colors, non-reflective colors, because in this specific frame, I'm literally walking in front of the camera. And as long as I stay moving, as long as my light stays moving, I'm not going to show up. The hard edges of my flashlight are not going to show up. You can use external flashes and just pop them, hit the test button and go, poof, poof. That, that helps too. I've even had people uh, flash their headlights on their car to help illuminate the foreground. Whatever you have. Getting a little creative with this idea. Again, 30 second exposure. So first five seconds is to illuminate the foreground with the rocks. And then the rest of the time is spent just standing still holding that light straight up in the air so that your form is burned into that image and captured properly. You can even use laser lights if you want. This one was uh, I took with my colleague, Mark Morris. He takes care of the Rocky Mountain region. Great night photographer had kind of a Christmas theme going when <laughs> we were out in Phoenix. Um, in this specific scene, we had, the, uh, we had a group of photographers out, maybe 10 of us all kind of spread out semi-circle around this scene. And one of us held the flashlight on the cactus so that we could all find focus on it first using live view um, primarily, but you can use your eyepiece too. But as long as the cactus is lit up, you can find focus on it manually. And then again, take down your, your focus so that it doesn't move. And then someone said, okay, go. Everyone opened their, their shutters at the same time. Designated people painted in the cactus with the laser lights. And then everyone's exposures kind of ended at the same time. We did this over and over and over again. When it comes to painting with light, not every photo is, pretty much every photo is gonna be specifically different. It's gonna be uniquely different. It's very hard to reproduce something that you like. So again, be creative, have fun with it. There really is no formula to start with when we really get into painting with light. Have a vision for what you want the scene to be. Again, wear black unless you want your clothes to show. Um, my, my only guideline that I can give here is use your ISO to control the ambient light. So in a true painting with light scene, I'm gonna be in an urban environment. I'm gonna be in a city park. I'm not gonna need to get out into the middle of nowhere. Definitely going to bring a friend because one of us is going to be running in and out of trees with, with lights or riding a bike through a scene or whatever. I'll show you. You need someone to, to hit the shutter button. You need someone to um, start the frame so that you don't really have to be running back and forth. If you want more ambient light in your scene, so you want to see more of your surroundings, higher ISOs, 1600, 3200. If you want no ambient light, really dark contrasty scene. This is what I like. This is my style. Lower ISOs, 100, 200. And this is what I'm talking about. Just being really creative with the scene. Using symmetry in these trees and the parking lot, I promise you, is right off on the left hand side. My car is back there and there's street lights back there. But because my ISO is so low, my base exposure is black. You cannot see any of that light. Again, hit the flashlight from the camera perspective to uh, focus on these trees, focus on my foreground. This is a 30 second exposure. And so again, I had, I had my friend behind the camera say, okay, go. And I grabbed my flashlight. It's just a simple little flashlight, nothing fancy. Walked into the frame with it pointing down, walked through these trees, kind of poked around. Anytime the flashlight hits the camera, it's gonna star out. And then I used a little bit of the remaining time to illuminate the trees, but just by going. 
Um, other exposure tips in this one, if you want stars like this, it's going to be a higher f-stop. So in this scene, it was 30 seconds ISO 100 um, f11, so I can get starburst in my light. And again, everyone's going to be a little bit different. Trying to figure out, like, what do I want this light to do? What's the story I want to tell? It's kind of thinking of little fairies or, like, wood nymphs peeking around corners and just being really playful, running around the trees. This next one, in the same environment, has more of an other world sort of presence. This one had to be 60 seconds because I was covering a longer distance in this scene, and I had a bigger light. Uh, with this one, again, it's an LED light, but it's a big one. And anytime, um, you know, I'm pointing at the ground to illuminate the ground, I'm kind of flashing it up towards the trees to illuminate the, the, the leaves. And then the little spaceship shapes is when I'm walking through, I'm actually picking it up and putting it down, picking it up and putting it down. That was a happy accident, but I ran with, I like that idea. So in this scene, I uh, started behind this tree. Again, my buddy behind the camera said, okay, go, 60 seconds of time. Started just too quick up in these in the, in the leaves and then pointed it down, walked behind this tree and up and down and up and down. And then I used the rest of the time to run back into the background as soon as I could or as fast as I could. This light back here is actually a street light that's back in the parking lot. So that helped fill in the background a little bit. It's just fun. You spend a good couple of hours just hanging out with your friends, being creative. If you get something, great. If you don't, you go back and try it again at a later time. It's a good, it's a good outdoor activity. Let me show you one more technique. Still life painting. This is something that I that I really got into this winter, especially throughout the last year. I've, I've been fortunate enough to be working, but be working from home. So I could set up my studio, I could you know, rummage through and, and sort through all of these random things that I've been collecting over the last couple of years and put together these little scenes to photograph. This first one is just ambient light. So just to show you what these things are, I've got a, a clay tea kettle and some loose leaf tea in another little container. And when we talk about still life light painting, the idea comes from a painting technique called chiaroscuro photography or chiaroscuro painting. It's an oil painting technique from way, way back before. I don't even know what era it is, but there's a difference to it. There's a drama to it. Look at the difference here. Here, we're using the light to only highlight specific subjects and then letting the darkness engulf the whole thing. It's very dark, it's very dramatic, it's very contrasty, it's, it's got a beautiful mood to it in comparison to the ambient light version, yeah? So I love this stuff. And again, how do we do this? What is this technique? Our base exposure is black. I specifically made this frame so you could see that it's, it's black. <laughs> We're using the light to equal the exposure. But you think about it just like you would any other photograph. This is a still life. So I need a good depth of field, F8 is kind of my go-to product, uh, still uh, depth of field aperture. I want a nice dark blacks and nice dark shadow, so I set it up at ISO 100. And then it's just a matter of figuring out how much time do you need to expose the frame. Started with 10 seconds. Again, I'm in manual exposure, honestly, 100% guessing. I know what aperture I want, I know which ISO I want, I have no idea on time. 10 seconds was way too bright. So I'm like, well, what does two seconds look like? And all I'm doing is sitting behind the camera again, taking my flashlight and shining it at my subject. So I could see, is it way, way, way too bright? Is it not bright enough? Settled in at F8, ISO 100, five seconds was, was the, the key goal here. And then you just take a bunch of pictures and figure out what works. Again, trying to reproduce the things that work. This is a small selection of the many, many I took. And the idea here is I spent most of the time on the main subject, the loose leaf tea, couple seconds brushing it along at the top because I wanted to give a rim light. I wanted to give the idea of the tea kettle, but I did not want it to be a main subject. So I'm kind of hiding its identity a little bit. The flashlight, a little uh, good plug for your hardware store, 
Again, my, my little flashlight is this, just a little pen LED light, really nice and bright, so I'm not going to shine it directly at the camera. And you can go to the hardware store and get black half-inch lengths of pipe. Short one, a little bit longer one. For this scene specifically, I used an 18-inch one, really, really long. Diffused it with some scotch tape at the beginning. Totally DIY. But we use the pipe to direct the light and give you a really good handle so you can paint with it. And this gives you a nice, direct, nice focused beam to paint in that light. Let me show you what this looks like. This is why, unfortunately, you all shut your video off so I can play my video and you can see this. Five seconds, it's going to go fast. Using my remote, hit go. One, two, three, four, five. Catch it? Play it one more time. One, two, three, four, five. And that's the exposure. Put some good music on, just chill, play for a couple of hours, it's great. Not black fabric, it's actually on my piano. So this is, uh, this is the scene. This is on uh, my, my dark brown piano with some uh, stained blocks as the foreground. But because, again, I'm not illuminating the background, it looks black. It's not getting any light, so it's not getting any detail. One more. I encourage you all to run around your house and not run, but like go explore the things that you have and put like things together. Um, in this scene, I, was, I think I was missing the trade show markets because these are my trade show shoes. These are, these are a funky pair of, of shoes that I wear at the trade shows, and I haven't worn them for over a year. So I paired them up with this like French Nuove, um, like noir sort of photography. I wanted something 1930s, 1920s, really kind of black and white detective film-esque. Um, so I grabbed my shoes, put some lace socks in there. This is an umbrella that I like the texture of. Put on an open back chair. The setup is really not fancy at all. But I needed the transparent background because I wanted to put some rim light behind, again, my light to help give it a uh, definition. Mm -hmm. This one's a 10 second exposure because I needed enough time to run around back and light it up. Same sort of idea, F8. ISO 200 here. Well, no, ISO 100. I changed my ISO a little bit so I could get 10 seconds. That was the important part. First on the left, the main subject, a little bit on the secondary, and then I run around back to get that rim lighting. Be creative. Have a plan before you shoot. Sometimes sketch it out. Maybe write down the words that, you, that you're trying to replicate. You know, all of these things kind of help. Uh, the umbrella here was for the background. Great question, Ruby. This is just an umbrella I had in my closet. I liked the uh, the flower pattern. I think it mimicked the lace, so it kind of brought this whole scene together. Uh, in the in the daylight, it looks really sort of chintzy and sort of weird, but in the photographic light, it's actually quite beautiful. Again, I want to end today with uh, just this idea of low key photography. Talk about what it is and why it's important. Ways that you can kind of maybe. Uh, incorporate it into your own work. Low-key photography is um, something that I really enjoy. I love blacks. I love hard contrast. I love delving into this idea that you can layer similar tones together. In low-key specifically, this is, uh, this is an image that contains predominantly these dark tones and colors. Shadows are the primary element of the composition and images have this sense of mystery or drama. It just adds a little extra element. And in low-key photography, we're going to take our meter. If we're, if we are a photographer that photographs in an auto setting, like aperture priority, shutter speed priority, even program mode. That is fine. Cameras are going to want a meter to neutral gray, this one here. And so in low-key photography, we want to cheat our meter and underexpose it on purpose by at least a stop, maybe two, so we can turn those gray tones back to black where they're supposed to be. Similarly, or oppositely, with uh, high-key photography, it's the same idea. We're taking those gray tones and we're overexposing our photograph to get those gray tones back to white where they're supposed to be. 
Watch your histograms. Get to know what your histogram is doing. The idea here, again, is to have most of our tones here on the left for the shadows, but we don't want them falling over the edge. We don't want to lose that shadow detail, but we want to primarily have our tones here on the left-hand side. When I'm using low-key ideas in my work, thinking about opposites help create definition and shape in your photographs. So in this scene, I've got light on dark create separation. I've got dark on this light little area here create separate separation. Putting that light, single light, just kind of up on top off to the left here helps create those, those definitions, those, those opposites. So the photograph I think has better dimension. In a color sense, here's another great idea. We've got a model in a warm tone, really textured outfit using again a simple one light setup just to illuminate her face a little bit and we're going to put her on a simplified smooth cooler background thinking of opposites detail on smooth warm on cold is going to help create this definition again to do a quick recap in night photography we talked about the loony 11 rule the rule of 500 for Milky Way photography, and then um, really most importantly in this section, be patient, be prepared, do your research. It's going to help pay off. With painting with light in landscapes, we want to add that light into your night scenes to add interest into your foreground. With light painting creatively, be creative, be flexible. Again, kind of find out what story you want to tell and set this up. You can be really creative and, and um, use that light just to kind of run around. Still lives, again, the light equals your exposure. So think about your subject, think about what you want this photograph to look like and use the light to help highlight your subjects appropriately. Lastly, for low key photography, we're gonna embrace those dark tones. We're going to look for separation and contrast using opposites, light on dark, warm on cool, textured on smooth. We definitely have about 10 minutes left. That's the end of the formal part of the presentation. Thank you all for sticking through it. Thank you all for your time this evening or this morning, wherever you guys may be. You can find me socially, Bell Tamron USA, mostly on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, ben here locally is Tamron Ben Hutchinson. You can find anything that's going on in the Pacific Northwest with his posts. Anything I didn't touch on? Anything you guys want to hear more about? I'll put the call out for questions. I saw that. Thank you. Yeah, you you almost uh, uh, you you've taken over our job at collecting questions to to uh, get you at the end. Every time I write <laughs> like, it off and start addressing it, I'm like, oh, okay. Um, although. Uh, Aaron uh, would like you to explain how you use the pipe again. Oh yeah, sure. I can definitely do that. So in, let me play this video one more time. <laughs> again with that tea and the tea kettle. Make sure my sound is shut off. I'm listening to a terrible 90s alternative in this scene, so you don't want to hear that. Uh, terrible? <laughs> See how focused that beam is? That's because of the pipe. So if I can turn my light on and I'm not going to um, blind you all. I can figure out how to turn this on. One of those like press and stay on sort of things. Um, if you can see, I don't know. Let me shine. Ooh, let me shine my Tamron sign. So you see how like broad this is? How kind of diffused and spread out the light in? If I put this pipe in, it should be now really focused. So this is with the pipe. This is without. Hey, Jillian, would you mind um, stopping screen sharing so that we can oh, yes. see you big? <laughs> I, I didn't realize that either. I didn't either. OK, let me do that one more time. So this is the light with no diffusion or no focus. That's just a regular old flashlight. If I put the pipe in there, so all I'm doing, it's not, it's nothing fancy. I'm just sticking it in there and holding it. Look at how focused this beam is. 
in comparison. And I love that it gives me like a nice little wand so I can really paint in that light and, and figure out, I can stand up one and then actually move around my scene. Um, for the shoe photo, obviously I'm not gonna get this behind a chair very effectively, so I used my shorter one. It still kind of does the same job, but not, it's, it's easier to maneuver in a tight space. And if you really want to do this in a long period of time, just tape it again. That's what gaff tape is for. Just tape everything down. That's awesome. That's a really heavy tip. What about that for like uh, just diffusing light in general? <laughs> like that's yeah. a great tip. Uh, yeah, honestly, for that one, I diffused the light because it was too harsh for a while. Um, I grabbed some scotch tape, some regular clear tape, and I just taped the front of the pipe and it, it worked. If I needed more diffusion, I'd put more tape on the front. Yeah. If I needed a lot of diffusion, I'd grab a napkin or something, nothing too fancy. And you know, you could, you know, because I'm, I'm just thinking if, if with anything, even like, you know, portraits, if somebody doesn't have the the money to go drop on like a light kit or something like that, or just wanted, to, you know, a little more light to, you know, if you get like a, even a larger tube and put tape on the end of it and then just use a, a little, uh, um, what do you call that, the flashlight that's, that you have? Hmm? Like a mag light? Mag light, thank you. Um, yep. Yeah, in the back. That was that's that's a that's a it's a great DIY idea. I uh -huh. like that. The the trick is if you go to the hardware store specifically for this purpose, bring your flashlight with you. Because oh, a couple yeah. of times I don't get it quite big enough, and it won't actually like I have to tape it on. It's just weird. <laughs> well, and we have one other thing at the store too that's sort of it, it's similar. Um, if you've heard of cinefoil. Yeah, Essentially, yeah. It's, it's a heavy duty matte black on both sides, like tinfoil. So you can shape it whatever way you want and just sort of crimp it around stuff. So, so that's a, that's a handy one for, for just doing simple light modification. Mm -hmm. but I, the pipes, I like the pipes I I do very much. <laughs> Start carrying those at looking glass. Just go, <laughs> just, go your hardware store. And, and Our hardware store is actually next door. So we'll just let people, you know, <laughs> Up with both of us. You should buy the pipes and then put the looking glass logo on them and then you could sell them as looking glass light pipes. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Uh, anyways, uh, I like Laura, uh, was got another question. Best camera battery uh, for the uh, one hour shots uh, mm. to avoid running out of battery mid exposure. Yeah, that that's all another dilemma. Um, the biggest thing I can recommend in this scenario is to, if your battery is over a year, a year and a half old, and, and you are actively photographing on a regular basis, just buy a fresh brand new battery, then you should be fine. Um, a, a standard battery um, should last at least three or four hours. I would say if it's, if it's brand new, if it's fully charged, if it's not exhausted, if you haven't bought a number a replacement battery in over two years, definitely buy a second battery and, and use that. Uh, you can also get a vertical grip is another accessory that a lot of photographers will use. A vertical grip they make specifically for each camera and it allows you to put two batteries in instead of one. And they're not terribly expensive, right Jennifer? They're like two, three hundred bucks. For the vertical grips, it depends on the camera that it's for. There's yeah. total variation depending on depending on manufacturer. But um, the other thing I want to say, though, in regards to batteries, especially for night shooting, um, mm -hmm. is keep in mind the temperature um, because your batteries will die a lot faster when it's really cold. Um, so yes. always have extras and keep them like in your pockets on your body, um, so that you're you're getting the most power out of them that you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Daniel had a question. How concerned are you with CRI when choosing flashlight for light painting, which I think is a very good question. CRI. Color oh. rendition. Wait, say that one more time. It's, it's, I think it stands for color rendition index. I'm not sure if that's actually correct, but it's really the how accurate is the color temperature of the light? Ah, um, as an artist, I'm not really concerned about it. I have a friend who's an astronomer and he's very concerned about it. 
Um, so it just kind of depends. For for me specifically, that's kind of where those those um, color temperatures come into play. If you're really concerned about specific light temperature, if it's a white light, you can set up your exposure to, um, you can either set up your exposure ahead of time to um, be consistent with that white light. I know some photo flashlights are daylight, so you can set your white balance up to daylight and then they'll be white. Um, another thing you can do is bring something gray with you. So um, if part of the windmill was gray or part of the building, maybe there's some cement, something like that. If you can put something grayish in your scene, this will help with setting that white balance after the fact because you know that's pretty close. So you just hit, I know this is gray and then everything else kind of lines up. Yeah. Thank and I you. always recommend doing like a custom white balance in those kind of scenarios where, where you can just, you're matching your camera essentially to the light, especially mm -hmm. when you just got that one light source, mm -hmm. you, can, you can easily correct. And thank you, Daniel, for the correction. Color rendering index <laughs> is what it stands for. <laughs> you were close. You were very yeah. close. And I want to see some of Susan's pictures of um, the old trucks. Me too. Right? Oh, yeah. That sounds fantastic. He also would buy a looking glass pipe light or light pipe. Light <laughs> pipe. We're calling it a light pipe. I think it's happening. I love this. And you're going to get some credit. We'll have to credit, credit Tamron on there too, or just, you know, mm -hmm. we'll call it the, the Hutchinson looking glass light pipe. <laughs> the Jillian. It's really Jillian's pipe light. <laughs> True. Yeah. Not, I, I stole the idea from someone else. Like, I, I can't take full credit for that. Uh, none of us have new ideas. We just think we do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's never cheating if you're fully honest. And Things Aaron, like sitting in my car when it was really, really cold outside. I am perfectly fine with that. Yes. <laughs> uh, Aaron does remind everybody to uh, point the right direction when using your your apps for Milky Way shooting. Aaron, do you want to tell a story? Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> Not really, but you know, you do all this planning and, and you get out there before sunset and you're, you're pointed up, you know where the Milky Way is going to rise and you're off like by, I don't know, 20, 30 degrees and the Milky Way is over there and you're like, wait, it's supposed to be up and I can't find it. <laughs> it yep. happens. Yeah. The best laid plans, right? Yep. Well, yep. Also knowing what, I, I didn't talk much about it, but just knowing the direction of the neck of the nearest large city. So there's this thing called urban glow. It will change the color of the horizon. Um, I, I do like that many of the newer urban environments are switching to LEDs. So there's this gross yellow sort of old school urban glow is kind of going away. It's turning much whiter as, as the cities are updating their lights happening all um, around here for sure. there's not a, there's not a huge way to get around it if it's in your frame if you can isolate what color it is and you use your color sliders in your post-production you can kind of minimize that color or um, maybe switch it to something else there's a there's a selective color option in photoshop that i haven't used in forever but um, you can select a specific color whatever whatever light color those lights are and you can change it to a blue or a purple or you know make it something that's a little bit more complementary to your scene well jillian since we're um you know this is a uh tamron sponsored uh, uh class did you uh touch on i don't think you did the uh correct aberration correction which is something that's going to pull unwanted color um out of uh, potentially out of your images if you're doing you know, like night skies and stuff like that. Touch on chromatic aberrations. Is that what you said? The chromatic aberration correction that's in the Tamron lenses. Oh yeah. So lack of purple fringing and whatnot. Yeah, that's it. That's a good. That's a good tip, especially with the wider angle lenses. Mm -hmm. They have special front element nano coatings on them, so it will not only correct your scene 
So it's rectilinear, meaning you're not going to get dis distortion on the edges. You're not going to lose sharpness or brightness in the edges in the corners. That's something that Tamron is really well known for. But as far as the, the color rendition or this chromatic aberration, these coatings help correct the light so it goes through the lens without bouncing around and, and getting distortions in there. It's going to hit the sensor as correctly as possible. So uh, chromatic aberrations, we also call them as like purple fringing or yellow fringing. In, in high contrast areas, you'll actually see yellows or purples in, um, in some lower quality lenses. But because of these, these high quality nano filters we put on the front of these wide angle lenses, it's all corrected for. Mm -hmm. Lower quality lenses, I like that. <laughs> and there's actually, we work with Adobe to give uh, lens profiles to, uh, to Adobe, like Lightroom and Photoshop and their whole image suite. And so you can actually import your photographs and apply the, the lens profile. And so if there is any distortion, it'll be corrected. If there is any chromatic aberrations, because they do happen from time to time, they will also be corrected. Mm -hmm. Makes it easy. Sometimes it's a function of the, the camera or the sensor too. I have a, a Leica, um, which I love. And I wouldn't call it a low quality lens by any means. It's a phenomenal lens, but man, does it have like, I on my M240, it has the worst chromatic aberration in the highlights it's like just bright magenta and uh, and everything that's blown out ends up with a a halo a purple halo basically uh -huh. gotta call out susan um susan has shared some images in the chat i highly recommend folks check them out susan um i got to the first one and i don't know if you saw my face but my jaw just kind of dropped it. it's very cool very creepy that's like a super halloween shot <laughs> i don't know where you found that truck the truck is awesome, and so is that bottle. Yeah, are you a moon? Do you make moonshine? <laughs> Talk about telling a story. Mm -hmm. You you can do great things with ghosting. So if I use um, not a flashlight, but if I use a, an external flash and just we call it popping it, you have the test pop and it goes pop pop. Um, you can wear vintage clothing, which I know you guys have out there in the Pacific Northwest. And, and make ghost people on the shore. You, know, you, you dress up in, in, in period clothing, like 1800s or even 1960s or whatever you wanna do. And during this really long exposure, if you pop the light on these people for like part of it, if it's a 30 second exposure, you give them 10 seconds of time and then they walk off, they're ghosted. So that's, that's a really fun thing to do with, with people outside at night I've also set flashlights up on, on bicycles and have bicycles running through the frame. The light kind of bounces like a bunny rabbit. <laughs> if you're wearing light colored clothes, you kind of show up in the frame as well. So it's just, a, it's just another great way to play with the human element in these, in these night scenes. Yes. I think you take the creepy factor out of ghost photography when you start describing it as bouncing like a bunny rabbit. <laughs> well, <laughs> The joy of making photographs, man. Yeah. I never work too hard. You always got to enjoy what you do. All right. Great presentation. Great idea. Anything else, everyone? I know we're kind of running to the end of our class here. Yeah. Any final Anything questions? coming up, uh, Ben or Jennifer, that you want to highlight before we go? We've got all sorts of stuff coming up. In fact, what do we have, Ben? With you guys, we've got what? Four more classes lined up. I'll be announcing those shortly. Yeah, next class that's on on the schedule is uh, the uh, better um, seaside images. So there we go. Thank you, Jillian. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, and that'll be led by Erica, who's another one of our fantastic photographer and uh, tech reps. So um, I have not seen that one. Looking forward to it. I've seen lots of Erica's uh, seaside and beach photography. So. Um, I, I, I am certain it's going to be fantastic. So looking forward to that one. That will be next week. Uh, is that next week? Next week. No, we're off next week. Cause there is, That's uh, right. we've got the three photographers doing a presentation next Thursday, um, Nikon ambassadors. So if folks haven't signed up for that. That's also going to be free and incredible. Um, 
but I think it's the week after that and then ended every week following yeah. that. It's Tuesday the 25th, which um, folks will see on the, the link that, um, that Jillian just shared. Okay, cool. Perfect. But yeah, if you just sign up for the newsletter, the Looking Glass newsletter, if you're, I mean, if you're here, you, you're probably gonna get notifications about classes anyway, because we wanna make sure we're informing people about the stuff they're interested in. Um, so by all means, let us know if there's anything else that you wanna be hearing from us or learning from us. Please give us that feedback and give us feedback about the classes too. Um, whatever we can do to make as good an experience as possible for everybody is it's really why we're here. We're just, we wanna inspire, we wanna stay busy, we wanna have fun and um, I love connecting with everybody. This is my one chance to actually be part of a classroom and get a little FaceTime and not be sitting and doing paperwork. So thank you, Hans. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, the Thursday session, I think that's one of the, is that the Nikon session that you mentioned? Nikon sessions are generally not recorded. Um, and so that one probably won't be, but the Tamron ones are every, like I said, every vendor has different specifics that they require. And, um, and that one is going to, the one for the Nikon ambassadors, three Nikon ambassadors, crazy, um, is going to be really up up to them but there will be some follow-up stuff and and it's really around you know a common cause our our furry companions mm -hmm. um so so we're gonna be be talking about rescue animals and our relationship to them and just trying to do some good with that one it's that is not fair i feel like that should be ours yeah. uh, i mean look i've got my rescue animals here oh, yeah. in the background yeah. so don't i automatically <laughs> to be to be completely honest, it's actually two two ambassadors were having a conversation and they they were trying to talk about a completely different upcoming presentation, and as with all of us, um, got distracted and just wanted to talk about their pets, <laughs> and then decided <laughs> and then of course reached out to me because <clears throat> I'm a sucker. I don't know if you see my dog, but this is my Namaste home. With, it should be say dogs, but <laughs> Namaste home with my dog. That's awesome. Where would you get that? I, probably the internet you know the internet yeah I have no idea it could have even been provided to me um this one I've had for for quite some time and it came in very handy during quarantine it felt like I was representing <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those for my wife I'm, I'll see what I can do but Okay. Okay, that's taken care of. All right, but guys. Search the internet first. If it doesn't turn up results, then I'll come to you. <laughs> you could just sharpie it. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not like stylish. <laughs> All right. We've awesome. gone off the rails. Jillian, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're awesome. Um, and of course, our Looking Glass community. Thank you guys so much. Uh, we love seeing you again. Keep yeah. taking me away from the paperwork. <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep coming back and doing as many of these as possible. All right. Everybody awesome. have an excellent night. Yeah, we'll see you guys. Good to see you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Oh, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Totally awesome. Oh, Aaron, love you. <laughs>